This is the video tutorial that I promised you on how to use Excel to work up your data for the Density Lab. So I'm going to make this as quick as I can. Uh, I'm going to go through all of the essential features that you need. And then at the end, I will add some additional details, some more powerful features uh, for those of you who are interested. But I mostly just want to get through this once so that everybody has a chance to work up their data in Excel if they want to. Okay, so uh, the I've already put in some simulated data here. I made up a data set for another unknown liquid, not the one you had, but one with a different density. And so the volume points are the same ones that we used in class, 0, uh, 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. And I've started to put in the mass data that I took. So uh, 0 is just used as a place to hold the mass of the cylinder. And I probably want to title my columns. It's always a good idea to title your columns. So let me do that. Let me say this is now going to be the mass of cylinder and liquid and we're going to add the units in parentheses. That's pretty standard. And OK, so that looks a little bit funny because it kind of overlaps and goes into other columns, which we don't want. And the way I like to handle that is to click on it and use this wrap text option up here. If you click on that, you can see that now it adds more rows or uh, adds it expands the row so that you've got more lines of text that all fit in there. It looks a little bit odd, and so you can also stretch the width of the column a little bit and maybe um, you know, choose to center justify it. So now it looks a little bit better. All right, So you can play with these options and figure out how they work so that it looks the way you want it to. Right now, let's finish adding the data. And, and so I'm going to put in the rest of the values. I've got 80.00. I've got 96.11, I've got 112.02, and 126.08. So that's all my data. And one thing you may have noticed if you were following carefully is that when I put in 80.00, although that number has four sig figs and we want to keep them all, um, Excel by default is going to say, well, he put in that stuff after the decimal place, but it was all zeros, so I'm just going to truncate it. I'm just going to write it as 80. This, sig, this only has one sig fig, so obviously that's not acceptable. We want all of the masses to be represented the same way, and fortunately that's easy to fix. I can simply drag to select all of those values, and then if I right-click somewhere in there, it brings up this menu which includes an option to format the cells. There's a lot here, a lot of options. You're free to play with them, but I'm going to go to the one we want, which is number and decimal places, right? We want to represent every number in there to two places after the decimal because the balance we used to make those mass measurements was good to the nearest hundredth of a gram. So we've got that. We're going to click OK. And now you see that the 80 is reading properly as 80.00. So the next thing we're going to want to do, um, perhaps, is to subtract off the mass of the empty graduated cylinder, which is recorded in this first cell, so that all we are, are, are focusing on is the mass of the liquid. So we might type up here, mass of liquid in grams. Okay, and again, I'm going to want to word wrap that, or wrap text there, so that it looks nice, center justify it. And... Um, now what we're going to do is we're going to have Excel do the calculations for us. Of course, you could do these all yourself and copy them down, but that's bad for a couple reasons. For one thing, you're doing it, and you might make a mistake anywhere along the process, including in copying it in. And computers are supposed to do this stuff. They're excellent at it. And so there's a way in Excel, and it's very easy to make Excel do the calculation for you. And what's more, Excel is automatically set up to do the same calculation on every cell in, a, in another column. Okay, and I'll show you what I mean by that. The first thing we have to do is tell Excel that we're going to do a calculation. And so most of the time, you're just going to be typing in uh, values like we've been doing. We haven't worried about how we start those. If you want to type in a formula, you need to type in an equal sign as the first character. This alerts Excel to treat whatever you type after that as a calculation that it's going to do. And so instead of putting what I actually type in the box, like it has in all the other previous examples, it's actually going to put the result of the calculation in that box. And the calculation we want to do is we want to take whatever's in this cell over here, so we can just click on it, and you see that it popped up C3. 
C3 is the address of that cell, starting with the row position, which is it's in the C column, and it's in row 3. So C3 is the address of this box. You can also type that in. You see I'll get the same exact thing if I type C3 or if I click the box. Okay? And now if I, uh, I want to subtract off 49.27 from every value. So 49.27. Okay, and so if I hit enter, you'll see it gives me zero, exactly what I would expect. And so I could type in that formula for each one of these. Like I could go down here and I could type equals C4 minus 49.27, but that's, you know, silly. We don't need to do that. We can tell Excel to do the same calculation for every cell in this column. And yeah, okay, maybe we only have six now, so it doesn't make a big deal, but it's routine for uh, scientists and data analysts to work with spreadsheets that have thousands of rows and hundreds of columns. Um, and so there, you definitely want to have this stuff automated. Anyway, um, there's a couple of ways you can go back. I just hit the delete key to clear the cell, and you can also use uh, the undo arrow, right? So if I want to undo the delete I just did, I would click on this, and there, I've got my data back, okay? And so that was a C4, but I actually don't want that, so I'm going to undo it again, and I'm going to show you how to copy the operation we did here in all of these cells as we go down this column. And you just simply use this little green box in the lower right hand corner. If you click on that with the left mouse button and hold it down, you can pull down and you can see it automatically fills in the same calculation for each one of these cells where it's subtracting that 49.27 from C4. So it increments which cell is it's using for the initial value that it's subtracting the 49.27 each time it goes down. That's the power of Excel. It makes all of this a lot faster and a lot less error prone. There are other ways to do this that I'll cover at the end of the video. But for now, let's move on um, to show you how to actually graph it. Creating graphs in Excel is, is really simple and straightforward. That's kind of one of its main purposes, is for visual representations of data. And so, uh, just to show you what I mean, all we need to do to graph this is to pick any cell. You could click one of these, one of the titles, you could click any value in this area where we've been working, and you go to the Insert menu, and if you see here, there's a section called Charts. It doesn't call them graphs, it calls them charts, same difference. We want to do an XY scatter plot, which is this icon here. So we're going to click it, and you'll see it gives us some options about what kind we want. The kind we want in this class is always going to be the first one. So you can go ahead and click on that, and you'll see what I mean is that that made some really intelligent choices about how we wanted the chart to be represented. It re recognized that this first column was supposed to be our x-axis values, and then the uh, remaining columns were going to be different uh, groups of data that we wanted to have plotted on the y-axis. So this down here, this is called a legend, and that tells us that the blue dots are the mass of cylinder and liquid column, and the orange dots are the mass of liquid column. Okay, and so it's plotted both of those columns of data versus volume, all in one graph. So that's very handy and it was all automated and very quickly. So I think if you uh, get spend a little time getting used with this, used to this, you will see uh, the power of it and how useful it really is. Okay, so let's keep going. And um, now that we've got the data represented, we want to make the chart look the way or the, or the graph look the way we want it to. For one thing, you can resize it. Um, you can just grab the corner of the frame and pull it down if you want. Okay, and so now it's nice and big, and we can see it a little bit better. <coughs> We're also going to want to add a couple things to it. And you'll see if I click on the chart, we get this, this little uh, menu over here. The top one is called Chart Elements, and so if you click that, you can see there's different things we can add. There's a couple that are already there. There's the axes. There's axis titles. If you hover over them, I'm not actually clicking them, but I'm just moving the mouse over them, and it, it gives you a preview of what it's going to look like. So we're going to want to add some axis titles. And that's, that's, that's true, because we want to let people know that we plotted volume in milliliters on our horizontal axis. So 
axis titles are something you should always have on your graphs if you want people to understand it. And so what that means is you should have them on your graphs if you want full credit on your lab report. Okay. Uh, and we can go ahead and put mass in grams here for the vertical axis. All right. There's also a chart title. If we click on that, we can edit it. And so we're just going to call this unknown liquid sample. In your cases, you would probably call this um, the distilled water or unknown A, unknown B, unknown C for the data you're putting in your uh, lab report. But yes, a, a graph should have a title. So now this looks pretty good. Uh, I'd be happy to have this appearing in my lab report. The only thing that it needs is I need to analyze the data in the lab report. I asked you to do a linear fit and Excel can do that for you. The way to do it is you simply click on one of the data points in either series. If I wanted to fit the blue data to a line, I click on a blue data point. If I want to fit on the orange data, you can see it highlights the column over here to tell you what you're doing. So let's go ahead and fit the blue data to a line, right? So what I'm going to do is just tell Excel to find the best line going through that data. That line is called a trend line, and you can see here it says add trend line. By default, it's going to do a linear one, and then there's some other options we need to pay attention to. <coughs> These other ones are things you can play with. Uh, if you're a math, math whiz or if you're just curious, you can mess around with those. You may learn about them in some of your other courses, but more, most common is to do a linear fit, and we are going to want to display the equation on the chart. What does that mean? Well, any line has the formula y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. And so I'm going to want to see that information on my chart because uh, that's part of the information I asked you to report in your lab report. So I can just click this button and look at that. There's the equation. So what this did was it basically fit that data. It said the best fit line has this equation y equals 0.7745x plus 49.446. So there's your 0.7745 is the slope and 49.446 is the y-intercept. I'll leave it up to you to think about how many uh, sig figs those numbers should have versus how many they are, are represented to in the uh, in Excel, just like your calculator, Excel doesn't really know much about significant digits. It's relying on you uh, to take care of that after the fact. Okay, so we've now got our, our nice uh, equation. If we go back and we click on the uh, trend line, what you can see is, I don't know if that, I might have done that a little quickly. If you click on the equation, it gives you some formatting options for actually how this is going to appear. Okay, so now you're actually formatting what the equation looks like. If you want to get back to the options for the trend line, you need to click on it. And just hover over the dotted line and give it a click, and you'll see we get that format trend line um, menu back. The last thing is, is that we actually want to set the intercept here. Because we know something extra about this data, and we know that when that mass, uh, that cylinder was empty, we know exactly what its mass was. So we want to put that value in right here. We want to put in 49.27 for the intercept of this fit. And you'll see that changed the value a little bit. That changed the slope. Now the B value is exactly 49.27 like it should be, and the slope changed a little bit. Okay, before it was just picking the best line. Now it's picking the best line that goes through a point that we know has to be there. An empty cylinder has to have the mass of exactly the cylinder. So we're simply making it do that when the volume is zero. Okay, so that's this data set up here. And that's pretty much it for uh, formatting, uh, for putting on a trend line. Uh, I want to show you one more thing though, and that is if we go ahead and put, click on this trend line down here, we can do the same thing. We can right click, sorry, this data series, the second data series for just the mass of the liquid, we can add a trend line to that one. And all the same options point uh, come up. I wanna see the equation on the chart. There it is. 
I'll put it down here so we know which equation goes with which line. And you'll notice that the y-intercept is not zero, and it should be, right? Because we know that the uh, mass of zero milliliters of liquid is should be zero grams. So we are going to set the intercept, and it's 0.0, .0 .0 sounds good. And notice that, again, that fixed it so that the y-intercept is now zero, so they don't even bother showing it, and you just have the slope. And I will leave it up to you to notice what's similar about these two, uh, the, the equations for these two trend lines and why that makes sense. So you can leave that as, as sort of an exercise. But at this point, there's only one thing remaining to show, and that is how do I get this stuff into my lab report? So if you open up the Word document uh, that uh, has the, the lab in it, you can, of course, get that off the portal. What we can do is we can scroll down to where you have one of the graphs, right? We're supposed to plot the, the data for the, the distilled water here, and then you're supposed to plot the data for unknown A here, and so on and so forth. And you'll see that the elements of the graph here are the same elements we've been talking about on... Um, on the Excel graphs we've been creating. So what you can do here is you can click on this and you can delete it. And now you can go into Excel My computer's going a little bit slowly right now. Okay. And now you can click on the graph and if you click on the whole graph so that the frame lights up like that and then you right click it, you should be able to hit copy. So I'm going to copy that graph. And so now it's on my clipboard. And if I go back to the lab demo, I can click con control V or paste. Uh, I don't know if you're used to, to doing things by the keyboard like I am. You can click uh, control V. Otherwise, you can just go up here and click paste. And if I click that, it's going to insert that graph from my Excel file. And it may not look perfect, okay? You just want to make sure that it fits on the page. And you can uh, move things around in it. it. Because Excel and Word are both part of the same Microsoft suite, you can... Um, insert things uh, sorry you can move things around and the graph can be uh can behave like it's active and <clears throat> because i have a little text box here that had the label in it you can delete that and so this is perfectly acceptable if you put this information obviously it wouldn't say unknown liquid sample if you put it at this place in your file it would say distilled water and it would have your data for distilled water, and it would have your fits. You don't have to put both of these lines in your graphs. You can choose one or the other. Um, once you can explain to me why, what's the same about these and why it makes sense, um, once you can explain that, you can realize that it doesn't really matter which version you use. Um, you should be consistent. If you're going to use the mass of the cylinder plus the liquid for your distilled water, you should use the same data for all the rest of it. Okay, so that's it. That's the that's the tutorial. Um, and if you want to stop here and get to work, that's fine. Uh, I am going to go back and say a few more things about Excel and other more powerful ways to use it that some students might be interested in. Okay, so <clears throat> we're now back in Excel, and I wanted to show uh, students who are interested um, a, a little bit more interesting way of doing the subtraction, right? Uh, I want to show you that Excel is a dynamic piece of software, and that is if I make a change, for example, if I was to delete this data point, it deletes the data point from the graph, and it also updates the fit, right? It updates the linear fit. So just watch that real quickly. I want, I want you to focus on um, the equation right here, and I'm going to undo the change that I just did. And you can see that it changed the slope value because now it's fitting based on six points. But if I delete that point again, 
Now it's only fitting based on five. If I delete the, the point above it, now it's only fitting based on four and so on and so forth. So changes that you make to your data get updated elsewhere in the um, Excel document in real time for the most part. There are some examples of very advanced features where you actually have to say, I want you to do it now. But most of the time it's going to assume, oh, I, and you could take one out of the middle. Say I, I didn't like that data point. I take that out and it just deletes it off the graph and it updates the, the fit. Okay, so that's very handy. Another thing that's handy is suppose I had gone through the trouble of creating all of this in my Excel sheet and I looked at my notebook and I realized, oh my goodness, I wrote down the wrong mass for uh, one of the points. Like say it was this point here, it's 96.11. I didn't misread my handwriting and it's supposed to be 98.11. So now I can put in 98.11 and not only is it going to update that column, but it's going to update the graph. It's going to update this column because this column was based on a calculation and it's going to update this graph as well. So as soon as I hit enter, all of that's going to happen. This value changed. The graphs changed. You notice that the equations for both graphs changed. That's what it means for a piece of software to be dynamic, right? It's updating all of this stuff as you are working on it. All right, so I'm just, I hit control Z to undo that change. Um, another way that that can be powerful is suppose it wasn't the mass of, of one of the points I got wrong. Suppose it was the mass of the cylinder. Suppose I read 49.27, but it was actually 46.27. So now I can go and I can take out that. I can update that data point and say 46.27. And it doesn't quite work the same way because now this all of a sudden became minus three. Why is that? Because wasn't wasn't I subtracting the mass of the cylinder? Oh, but I went in and I put in 49.27 here. And then it's not only there, but it's in every single one of these other other uh, rows in those calculations. So it, it may seem like I outsmarted myself. And, and now I'm going to have to go through and update all those. And isn't that a pain? It is a pain. And the only reason you have to do it is because you didn't do it the best way the first time. And I'll show you what I mean. Let's undo that change. And now let's go back. I'm going to get rid of all this data here and just basically go back to the point where I had an empty column. And you'll see that my, my data series is going to disappear. The trend line, everything's gone because there's no data in here. But don't worry, we're going to get it all back. All right. So instead of typing C3 minus C3, or sorry, if instead of typing C3 minus 49.27, I could have just typed C3, and, and this is the value I want to subtract. So I could have just typed C3 minus C3, and that gets me zero, just like I expect. And now I'm like, okay, great, I'll just pull that down. Hmm, that didn't work. All of them are zero. And Thinking about it for one second will tell you why. I did C3 minus C3, and when I pulled it down, both of those updated. So we're almost there, but it might seem like we're stuck. What It seems like what we want is a way to tell it, no, I want you to update the first value, but leave the second value locked on the top value in this in this column. And there's definitely a way you can do that. What you have to do is you just have to put a dollar sign in front of each of the parts of the address that you don't want to change. In other words, remember this address C3 is telling you the column position and then the row position. So in this case, I don't want the row position to change. Okay, I want it to stay on C3 <clears throat> the whole time. And I don't want the row position or the column position to change. And so I simply would put a dollar sign in front of the C and a dollar sign in front of the 3. And if I fill that down, now it does the right thing again. So now we're back to where we were. And <clears throat> when we had typed in the 49.27 by hand and filled down, you see that the C4 updates, the C5 updates, and so on. But because of those dollar signs, it says stay fixed on that first value. All right. So this is <clears throat> a very basic and important feature of Excel is that when you're using addresses, 
Excel is going to make a reasonable assumption about when it should update those addresses. It says it, the assumption it makes is that I people usually want to update the addresses when they move to the next cell in a row or the next cell in a column. If you didn't, you would have told me that by putting in a dollar sign. So it gives you a way to say, no, stay fixed on just that first box in the column. Okay, the last, uh, the last thing I want to show you is now, the last part of this illustration is, so now when I go to my, my uh, notebook and I say, oh my goodness, that was 46.27, if I put in 46.27, it's going to update all of them because all of them were fixed on that C3 value, right? That was now part of the calculation. So I don't have to do a separate step where I update it. And that's a better way of organizing your calculations and your data compared to having to go in and have that hard-coded is the word for it. If I had 49.27 written in here and then that value changes, I have to change all of them. This is a way to make it update automatically. There's one little detail, though, that some of you may have noticed, and that is when I updated everything, one of the equations changed to match the new data, but the other one didn't. And that's because, well, here, when I made the trend line, I had the old y-intercept value in there. Remember, I fixed it to go through the y-intercept that we knew was correct. We knew that when the cylinder is empty, it should have the mass of just the cylinder, which used to be 49.27. Now it's 46.27. So that updated properly. Right, this is now zero for the orange data, and that value of the slope changed to the new best fit line, whereas this one is still going through the old y intercept. So we can change that, right? I'll give you a second to think about how. Remember, we're going to click on the trend line, and that will open it over here, and we can go down and find that option where we can set the intercept. So instead of 49.27, it should be 46.27. And when I hit enter, it updates. And now the slopes of the two lines are the same and they look the same. They're going through the points the same way as they did before. Okay, so that's uh, all I wanted to show you for this Excel tutorial. I hope that if you stuck with it to the end, you're sort of starting to get an inkling of how powerful this can be uh, for analyzing your data, for organizing your data, for doing calculations with your data, and minimizing the potential sources of error when you're doing all of this. That's one of the really big benefits to having a computer do all of this. If you have to repeat a calculation 100 times, you're going to make probably a few errors. Right, either in writing it down or just putting in your calculator. Computers won't make any errors. They're going to do exactly what you tell them to every time. Okay, And so uh, that's where they really can come in handy. And so if we have large amounts of data, this gets more and more useful. And that's one of the major reasons why scientists like to use spreadsheet programs for analyzing their data.